G-Skills new Trident Z Royal Series DDR4 RGB memory kits are made for high-class PCs, with each meticulously crafted module featuring a full-length crystalline light bar atop a polished heat spreader with a luxuriant reflective gold or silver finish, reminding you to appreciate the finer things in life, like the freedom to choose from Trident Z Royal RGB kits in 16GB to 128GB capacities and up to DDR4 4600MHz memory speeds. If you're looking to give your high-class system build the Royal treatment, click the sponsor link in the description below. What's up guys, welcome back to Paul's Hardware. This is Probing Paul, episode number 32. This is my monthly q and I answer tech questions, random questions, whatever you guys happen to ask. And I always start out by looking at past Probing Pauls. That's it's history right there. That's a long portal looking into the past, which is very meaningful. But if you guys have any questions for next month, feel free to leave those down in the comments section below. I am going to start answering questions that are derived from last month's video from that comment section, starting with Darko Preveronko here, who says, good job so far with you since the new egg days. Will positive pressure airflow uh, in a case hurt my component's temperature? And also are any plans for the 1 million subs milestone? I am hoping to hit a million subs soon. I'm very excited about that. I don't have anything too specific planned, except there is gonna be a giveaway that a few vendors have already volunteered to participate with. Uh, and then I'll hopefully be getting my 1 million subs plaque and everything, uh, which I've been looking forward to for many, many years since I've been in YouTube for like almost 10 years years now, give or take. Back to your actual question though, when it comes to positive pressure in a case, your main concern when it comes to positive or negative pressure is gonna be with dust and dust buildup. If you have positive pressure, as long as there's somewhere for the air to escape, you should be okay and it shouldn't affect temperatures, uh, at least if you're comparing positive versus negative airflow. So that's the general perspective on that. Uh, positive is generally preferred because it will cause less buildup of dust inside your case. Next question from Dustin Pennell. He says, for the probe, does vertical versus horizontal installation matter with an all-in-one cooler? And I believe he's talking Talking about the radiator here. He's seen both but never compared the two and the manu his manufacturer manual says to install his horizontally. Also, he's following up on what people have planned for 2019 that I asked last month. He says he's got a new baby girl expected mid to late February. Congratulations, Dustin, uh, on the new baby girl. Now you said you haven't seen this done, but I'm actually going to link in the description three different videos. One is from uh, Kyle who I often work with and he did a comparison a couple years back. I already got over a million views. His conclusion was that yes, it does matter and putting the radiator vertically in the front of the case did a little bit better for him. However, that's not borne out in all the tests you compare side by side. So there's a link to Jay's video when he did this back in 2015 as well, comparing front mounted radiators to the top mounted radiator. And then there's also a Linus Tech Tip video, uh, this is from 2016 that Luke did where he compared radiator fan configuration and whether or not that matters. So feel free to check out those videos, but I'm gonna give you an answer that you're probably not gonna like as much, was, which is that it depends on your specific scenario. It also depends on what the radiator is connected to. Chances are you're talking about a CPU radiator. So if you put a CPU radiator as an intake at the front of the case and the CPU has a heavy load on it, that's gonna get warmer and warmer over time and it's gonna increase the ambient, tem ambient temperature of your entire case and probably increase your GPU temperatures. That said, if you put it at the top with uh, fresh air coming in from the front, your GPU temperatures might be lower but your CPU temperature might be hotter. It depends on what's being cooled, on the software that's being run, on the case itself, on how many overall fans are in the case so the only real way to tell for you what the best radiator placement is, is just to try them both. Try it in the top, try it in the front, see which one works better for you. Next question here from Thailand who says, Hey Paul, love the videos. I own an EVGA GTX 1080 Ti for the Win 3. I don't wish to overclock it because it's already got a factory OC. Just wants to monitor it and keep it nice and cool. Beyond the NVIDIA control panel, do I recommend any other software? For example, Precision X OC. So Tyler, my initial answer would be, uh, you probably don't need any additional software if you're not planning on doing any more overclocking, but you did mention that you wanna keep an eye on temperatures and the NVIDIA control panel actually doesn't do that. So one thing you might want additional software for is just to keep an eye on the temperatures, just to see what they're at. Also get an idea what they're at now so that like six months down the road, you can look at them again and be like, oh, I usually run at you know 60 degrees C on my GPU while I'm gaming. And now I see it's up to 80 or so, maybe I should get in there and clean the dust out. If you want to monitor GPU temperatures, the software I like to use is Hardware Info 64, HW Info 64. That'll actually get you monitoring for a bunch of different stuff in your computer. If that's too over the top, you can definitely try EVGA's Precision XOC, which is very good software and will also allow you to monitor the temperatures and adjust fan speed and stuff like that, which can be fun. The other cool thing that Precision XOC will allow you to do is control the RGB lighting on your graphics card, which you may or may not want control over of. So those are some of the benefits you can get by going with additional software, but 
for your purposes, I'd say you mainly just want something to keep an eye on that temperature. And like I said, that's mainly for long-term use so you can see what you're used to running at when it's nice and clean and new and keep an eye on it and see if temperatures go up over time. Next up is Mr. Meech who wants to add storage to his PC. He wants a four terabyte drive, but he's noticed that two two terabyte drives you can get for about 20 to 40 bucks cheaper than a single four terabyte drive. I'm assuming you're talking about mechanical storage here. If you got the room in your case and you have available SATA ports, what are the pros and cons of going with two drives versus one? I'm gonna to touch on three things here when it comes to the difference. One is if you have two drives, you can set up RAID. That is if your motherboard has a RAID controller built into it that you can enable. And RAID actually is pretty useful in certain circumstances. You can mirror the two drives so you get the same data on both, or you can stripe the two drives with RAID zero, meaning it combines them both together so you only see a single four terabyte drive in your operating system. And it would probably run a little bit faster when it comes to read and write speeds if you're running RAID zero zero versus a single drive. That said, RAID zero is also known as zero redundancy, which means that if one of those drives dies, you lose all of the data. So that's not always a recommended configuration if you're talking about something that you want some data integrity with. That leads into my second point, which is that with two drives, you have two potential points of failure. If you're using them both separately, then that means you could have one drive die that you lose stuff on and still have the other functional drive. If you're using the RAID configuration, then one drive will kill your entire array. Or if you're using RAID 1, you can lose a drive and you'd still have all your data on the second drive. But if you're talking about a simpler solution where you're not using RAID and you just have two individual drives, then the main functional difference is gonna be that with two drives, you have two separate drives to put stuff onto. So you're gonna need to sort your data between the two of those manually, which usually isn't a big concern, but beyond that, it's just a matter of the extra drive will use a little bit more power, although that's mostly negligible, and maybe generate a little bit more heat. So hopefully all of those factors you can assess and decide whether you want to spend that extra 20 or 40 bucks on the single drive versus getting two smaller ones. Next question is from KillerSpike911. He says, what should I use in a build for web browsing, some video streaming, and some light gaming? Any form factor on a small budget? So Spike, if you're not aware, every month I do monthly builds, usually at the beginning of the month, so check out my monthly builds video for January where I cover a bunch of different system builds with parts lists from PC Part Picker and I go down different parts and how much they cost. What you're going to want is something akin to the $600 gaming PC build that I put together, which has an R3 1200 and an RX 580, but instead of buying both of those, you should just spend 95 bucks on the Ryzen 3 2200G. This will get you a quad-core CPU, which is perfectly fine for streaming if you're talking about 1080 or 720 and it's got built-in Vega graphics. There is a 2400G that has a better graphics integrated solution, but that's more like 170 bucks. And at that point I start to feel like, well, maybe you should just get a separate CPU and GPU like I recommend in the video for $600. But the point is that'll get you a full-size ATX system with plenty of room for expansion that handles the things you need it to do. And it'll only cost you about $420 with today's prices, which I think is a pretty good deal. That includes 16 gigs of RAM, a 240 gig SSD, as well as a full-size case and 600 watt power supply. Just a few more questions ago, this one from a friend of the show, Yota Ninja. He says, when switching from an APU to a dedicated GPU, do you need to run DDU? And if you're not familiar with those acronyms, APU is just like I was talking about with the 2200G, CPU and GPU in the same chip. Move into a GPU, so now you're installing a graphics card, and do you need to run DDU, which is Display Driver Uninstaller, which is a third-party app that goes into your system, digs out any display driver specifically, so you can get a fresh, clean install if you're swapping between graphics cards. Now, the short, simple answer here is no, probably not. If you're running Windows 10 or even Windows 7, for that matter, you should just be able to install the new graphics card, load your new drivers, and it'll replace the old driver stack with the new driver stack. What I would do is run display driver uninstaller and then do a fresh clean install of my driver. If I'm specifically moving from an AMD APU, which would be using Vega and AMD Radeon drivers to an NVIDIA graphics card. And that's just because, I don't know, I have a thing about moving from AMD to NVIDIA, one to the other back and forth. I always run DDU in between just to make sure everything's playing nice with each other. Probably not as big of a deal if you're talking about going from an Intel integrated graphics solution to AMD or NVIDIA. But I guess to me, it's kind of the same thing as like a Windows installation. Yes, you could probably do an upgrade or an in-place upgrade, but it's just always safest and best to do wipe it, start fresh, start clean. So I would run DDU personally. Next question, also from friend of the show, Guido Salducci. He says, I'd really like to see a walkthrough for reno renovating your bathroom, even if it's, if it's a vlog type video. Uh, and he's always liked my hardware videos and he enjoyed my uh, pun of, of holding my cock in the last video, which was uh, obviously intentional. Now Guido, this was last month, so I'm guessing you probably have already seen it, but just in case you didn't, I did do the follow-up to that video. I didn't want to string people along like I had been doing with the HTPC video for so long. Uh, so there it is. My, my bathroom, it is completed. It came together very nicely. 
Uh, it's got cool stuff like a toilet paper roller and everything. So I'll link that down in the description too. Uh, check it out if you missed it. Next question from Roy Evans. He says, out of every PC part you've ever used, which one or ones have been the best bang for your buck at their release? He'd like one part for each component. I'm gonna do CPU and GPU just because I don't have that much time. Uh, but also he followed up on 2019. He's getting a new job, a new car, and a new apartment. And by summer, I a new PC build. That's a real nice set of new things, Roy, so I wish you the best of luck in all that. When it comes to your question, though, so for the GPU, I'm gonna choose the NVIDIA GeForce GTX 570. This actually came out in 2010. It is a Fermi-based car, but it is the second generation Fermi stuff, which was based on 40, 40 nanometer, which was down from, I think, what, 50 or 52 nanometer from before? When I first read the question, what popped into my head was the 70 series cards from NVIDIA, because those have been very consistent, sort of middle-of-the-road GPUs that perform well, and they're not terribly overpriced. And the 570, I think, comes to mind because it was a follow-up to the 400 series, the original Fermi cards, which ran really hot, they weren't very efficient, and it was just sort of a night and day difference going from 400 series to 500 series. They were much more efficient, they ran much cooler, you could overclock them pretty well, and I think that was sort of the start of the kickoff of like the 500 series, 600 series, 700 series, 900 series, where Nvidia was really kind of kicking AMD's butt. A close second to this would be the GTX 970, and I know a lot of people are gonna be like, oh my god, 3.5 gigs of VRAM and everything, but the 970 was a really solid card for the price, very overclockable, especially with some of the aftermarket versions, and I think both of those GPUs are just GPUs that a lot of people got, a lot of people gamed on, and a lot of people gamed on a lot, and didn't have to spend, you know, 500 bucks plus. For the CPU, I'm gonna go with the venerable Sandy Bridge Core i5-2500K. Still available at Amazon for $280. Don't, don't buy it. Don't buy it now, it's not worth the money anymore. But the 2500K and the 2600K to me are the last time when I was, like, Intel was just, like, dominating. And not just dominating because they had good products, but they were also compelling products at the prices you could get them for. The 2500K you could usually get for 200 to 220-ish dollars, Overclocking was amazing on it. You could crank up the voltage, you could get so much more performance out of it if you were willing to go in and tweak and tune a few things. So to me, it's kind of the consummate DIY PC product because it lets you do something yourself, build your own PC, and then do something with it where you're like, this was totally worth it for me. I was able to do something that most people can't do to get more performance and more for my money. So when you talk bang for the buck, 2500K still, I'd say is the high point for Intel. And um, if Intel wants to redeem themselves in the eyes of a lot of people with AMD's competition over the past two or three years, I think what they really need is something like the 2500K, a reasonably priced CPU that overclocks well, that you can get more performance out of. I don't know if they're actually gonna do that, but, um, I hope they do. I mean, they have the competition from AMD to encourage them to do that. So Intel, if you're listening, please, please do another 2500K. And lastly, these are responses to the question I asked at the end of last month's video, which is what are you guys doing in 2019? And I just pulled up a few people who had responded like Ty Roberts, whose plans to sit, stand, and potentially breathe if it is in the budget. I understand, Ty, budgets are tight in 2019, but uh, we're gonna come through it stronger than ever. Next up is Patriotic Oreos, who says he's quitting his job on Sunday, which would have been three weeks ago, I think, and he's getting a new job in construction for the new year. So congratulations, Patriotic Oreos. I hope the job quitting was satisfying, and I hope the new job is treating you well so far. And finally, Ryan Hulse here, who gets the award for being the most thorough, because he's got like his mother-in-law's and great-grandma's birthday. Ryan's turning 35, and he's got a new house in Northern California, that you got for 430,000, that, that's a good deal. Uh, moving in July, tons of stuff planned for this year, so you guys feel free to read over that. Thank you, Ryan, for sending that all in. Have fun in Vegas, and thanks to all you guys who posted comments in last month's video, and of course, post comments in this month's video if you want me to answer them in February, which is coming very soon. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. This has been Probing Paul, episode number 32. I'll be back soon. Hit the thumbs up button on your way outs. We'll see you guys next time. Bye.